Film Festival, one of my favorites on the planet. My name is Cricket Rumley. I am the panel's director for the Tallgrass Film Festival. Thanks for coming. Uh, my day job is that I am the senior director of the Film Festival Department at the New York Film Academy. I am based in Los Angeles because the New York Film Academy has main campuses in New York, Los Angeles, and South Beach, Florida. So, we have a little surprise gift. Um, it was the idea, let's give a, a round of applause for our, our volunteer, Chris, who said, let's play Oprah. So, look under your uh, chairs, and some of you are going to find that you have a bag. Yes, a little tote bag. There, there are some around. Uh, if you have, oh, there we go. Yes. Snag it. Awesome. Uh, so, a little, a little parting gift. Uh, for the, the lunch with you. Um, today, I would like to thank, again, the Tall Grass Film Festival for inviting me here and to these wonderful panelists who we're about to hear from. We're going to be talking about the short film and how you can use the short film to move your career forward. Obviously, we're going to have some festival conversation, but I think that it would be really helpful for all of us to kind of move beyond that to talk about career building, pathways, and some of the stuff that is a little challenging for us to figure out because this is not like medical school where there is a clear pathway and trajectory. And I had a conversation with one of my job filmmakers who is a uh, doctor in his 40s and he was like this makes no sense how do i build a career and i'm like okay yeah yeah <laughs> you are correct um so we have panelists who i'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and we're going to hopefully be able to expand talk about this topic in a way that helps y'all clarify some goals give you some tips uh for a building a career in an industry that's pretty darn challenging. That was really optimistic. Anyway, Alex, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do. I'm still trying to figure out who I am. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Hey, I'm Alex Megaro. Um, I'm a filmmaker here. I'm here this year with my short documentary, Crush the Wrestler. Uh, woo! Yeah, cheer for my film. Um, I started off in the narrative, strictly in the narrative world. I made a feature that won uh, the Grand Jury Prize at Slam Dance. We had a, tried to leverage that into a career of sorts, but then things kind of shifted by pure accident. I went into put the other foot in the documentary world, and we've mostly done that since. Um, I've knocked out a few short films, short documentaries, and been able to leverage that into getting a full documentary feature independently financed. So that's something we can discuss. I'm Caitlin Cody, I'm a local filmmaker, and this year I was a juror, uh, juror on the uh, female feature and the uh, documentaries. Hi, I am uh, Tina Carboni, and I have a, um, I'm a producer on a feature here, The Secret Art of Human Flight, which Woo! even does Sorry about my voice, I've been screen talking all weekend and uh, <laughs> haven't shut up, so this is, here I am again. Um, yeah, I, I produce uh, a lot of shorts, I think I have about 60 shorts under my belt over the last 10 years or so, um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here talking about them, because I do a lot of them. Oh, you're I'm Benjamin Wiesner. I work for Vanish and Angle. We're a VP of Sales and Distribution. Uh, we do like three to five movies a year, depending on the year and whether or not there's strikes or pandemics. Uh, <laughs> I also uh, co-founded the Short to Feature Lab with Jim Cummings. We've done four with our fifth upcoming this year, which have like eight features that have come out of them so far, which is about double the Sundance Institute's average. So. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, I just want to say two things. Number one, I think that if you if you have lost your voice by the end of a film festival, it's been a successful festival. That's number one. Uh, number two, I want to remind our panelists that if you can take the keep the mic close to your mouth so they can hear us because we're fighting that noise over there. All right. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to talk y'all to talk a little bit about how working on and making short films 
helped your career and what some of the some of the ways that a short helped you get to a next step. And so Alex, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I'll stick to my current documentary path because it was like after doing that feature, uh, kind of reset once I went into doc world. So a couple of years ago, I was producing a feature with my now filmmaking partner, and it was exhausting, it was grueling. But at the end of it, we were, we were also freelancing and doing like corporate shoots and whatnot, just trying to get paychecks. So we go, hey, how can we be creative and make something that we, feels fulfilling, but we can do it from our couches after we're done at the end of the day, because we're just so exhausted. And we had always been interested in found footage and archival. So we said, let's, let's just try to throw something together, just on a whim, you know, just to feel good about ourselves, that we're still making something on the side when we're not so exhausted from one of these feature shoots. And we put together a short called 808, How We Respond. It was about the Hawaii missile, the false missile alert back in 2018. And we took uh, footage from mostly influencers, vloggers, and whatnot who were live streaming when they got the alert after they thought they were going to die for 40 minutes and kept filming themselves, and then once they found out that it was false and they had the relief of their life. We put this thing together not knowing uh, if it would even work. We just wanted to play around and hopefully something good would come of it. it I think the film came out pretty well. Uh, it ended up premiering at Sheffield Doc Fest, uh, played at Tallgrass as well, I ended up at AFI Docs, and we just said, okay, we stumbled onto something. Uh, we've been interested in trying this, taking a risk in this form. Can we leverage this into anything? And he and I hadn't seen each other for a while. We congregated again. We got really drunk at this bar, which is a great piece of advice. Always get drunk with your filmmaking friends because as we drank more, the idea that we were kind of half joking about of can we pitch this short film to a larger company and get them to pay us to make a whole bunch of them just became a better and better idea the drunker we got. By the end of the night, we're like, ah, oh, shit, I guess we gotta follow through on this. So, but it, it was kind of a happy accident. We had just made, stumbled into this new form that we enjoyed working in, and through any contact we had, and in some cases, cold submissions, we're sending it to companies, just trying to see if anyone would latch on and want to talk to us more. Uh, it ended up getting into Vice, uh, through a, and just like passed around within the company, and there was some interest in it, and it was getting a little higher, and then, uh, COVID hit, and they came to us right after that and said, "Oh, you have a you, you've offered a feature or you offered a documentary series made by two people from your couches. That sounds great." <laughs> so I guess part of this is you have to luck into a global pandemic for your thing to be picked up. <laughs> but what happened is just we had made something that we believed in that we were just made for ourselves and hoped work, and then. But, uh, found a way to leverage that and I guess you'd say creatively thinking where can we send it just to turn it into something else and eventually we've got this season, the first season Greenlight, it turned into two full seasons of a show called Source Material which was all short fully archival and found footage documentaries and we also did, we ended it with a one hour television special on January 6th which was very uplifting and we, and we ended up doing a lot with that and because of this series, because of this show we just made for the hell of it uh, we got the series, then we had like six hours of proof of concept that we can do this style of filmmaking. So that's what eventually led us to uh, an idea that we've been pitching around for many years. It wasn't going anywhere. Suddenly we have lots of proof that we can pull off a feature in this style, which led us through a whole roundabout uh, adventure that we ended up landing on someone who took interest in it, who worked with an archive, and we ended up getting a, a feature in that style uh, independently financed. So it just, you find a way to leverage anything that you have. And, you know, we had a crazy adventure with it, but it worked out. You know, I want to add something to this. The, I work with hundreds of filmmakers a year, and I find that the filmmakers who have strong teams are the ones who can sustain the knocks and the circuitous nature of this business more effectively than people who are single on their own, doing it on their own. And so that's one thing that 
I think is really important is finding the people who are going to be able to be part of your team in a healthy and productive way. Um, because it's like, you're getting drunk at a bar and you have a great idea, like, and you have the ability to push it forward. That's, that's uh, very exciting. Um, something else that I want to talk about, uh, Tina, let's go to you and talk a little bit about you have made a career producing short films. So tell us about how you got started doing that and what, how you're making your living these days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi. Um, so uh, I didn't start out producing. I actually went to school for directing and editing and um, just happened to be a type of personality that loves also a spreadsheet as well as the creative side. Um, and so I was always the one that was putting everything together and organizing and making sure people were showing up where they needed to be. And so that kind of led to the producing side of things. Um, I moved to LA in 2010. Got a job as a junior producer, which is basically a glorified PA, which turned into kind of videography and so on and so forth, and was working with somebody that we were not the I'm a collaborator, I love people, he not so much. So 2013 I broke off on my own and was doing a little bit of videography here and there, and then friends have started coming to me and saying, like, hey, will you produce this short? I want to do this short, how do I do this short? And so I started taking on just friends' projects, not getting paid or getting paid a couple hundred dollars or whatever and learning by doing. Um, learning how to put a you know production binder together correctly and learning you know to put a Dropbox together and what we needed. And um, from there, I was nice to people and I followed through, which I think are two things in this business that will actually get you further than knowing all the things you should know. Um, people started referring to their friends and so it became producing for friends of friends and then friends of friends of friends and then you know people started crowdfunding for money and I got paid a little bit more so on and so forth. And so by like, I would say 2015, 2016, it kind of became, I was doing two, three projects at a time, just juggling them. One would be a pre, one would be shooting soon, one would be a post, and I just kept that cycle until the pandemic, pretty much, um, you know. And uh, yeah, it, it slowly became a career because everybody would refer me to the next person. And um, yeah, I, I think, like you said, I think the biggest testament of this is just finding the people that are your type of people. I'm a very kind person and I want everybody to have the best set experience and I'm kind of known as like a set mom because I make sure everybody's doing okay and everybody's respected and if you're treating somebody wrong, you're like, hey, don't. And so, you know, you find in doing, you're maybe not my people and you let them go and then you collect more people. And so the more people I collected, the bigger my, you know, repertoire of films got, but also I became somebody that people would contact to, like, do you have a DP? Do you have a this? Do you have a that? And they know I always choose good people first and then good at their job second, because you can teach people a job. You can't necessarily teach people to be a good human. So yeah, through that and just having a circle and the work ethic of like making it happen, that's, that's kind of how I have made a career out of doing shorts. I do a lot more shorts than I do features. I maybe do one or two features a year. But uh, yeah, shorts are kind of the, the thing I do the most, so, yeah. I, lo I love that, that you were able to start out just doing it for friends, doing it for yourself, PA, doing things for free, and then start charging money, and then get to the point where you're making a living. And I think that's something important, too, that we all need to think about, is how are we gonna make a living? I bet a lot of people in this room do not have a trust fund or, uh, you know, some sort of monthly source of income. And, <laughs> and I am really, really interested in sustaining, how do we as artists sustain ourselves as we continue to create? I think that's a really noble thing to be able to do both and challenging at the same time. Um, Let's move to Caitlin, and I'm going to start the, a little bit of the film festival conversation now because you've been involved with Tall Grass for a long time. You're a judge this year, so can you talk a little bit about what you've learned about short filmmaking and career building and through your work here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my first year at Tall Grass was actually like in 2016. I came uh, to be a uh, an intern with Gretchen uh, during the festival, and it was my first time ever experiencing like film in that way. So um, I loved it so much that I came back as an emerging programmer, which is like the student program here, and I learned a lot about like reviewing films. So I got to watch like 
I think I probably watched like 250 student films that were like shorts that year. Uh, and it was a learning experience because I was making my own films at the time, but I was able to watch other people's and like realize how other people made them. Um, and then after I graduated high school, I became like a programmer and volunteer here. So I've been watching like lots of movies made by people um, all across the world that come here. And I think for me, as like a judge and a programmer, I, I thought it was really cool to be able to talk to other filmmakers about their like process and how they um, were able to make uh, short films and then make features and stuff. So I think it's cool to like um, learn from people. So even just being here is great because you get to talk to so many people and, and meet them. Like I have so many friends that I've met here that I now work with, like locally even. So um, film festivals are like the best way to make connections or even just to be able to see how other people work and how you can um, like grow as a filmmaker and uh, do better, I guess, and be inspired by people's movies. So um, yeah, I think uh, even judging this year, uh, it was a cool experience because I got a judge with Melanita and uh, Jennifer. So it was cool to hear their perspective on everything. And um, I don't know, film festivals are just like a really, really great community of uh, different types of people that uh, I probably wouldn't hear their perspectives of otherwise. Right. One of the things that I, I always have to say to my students is you have no idea how passionate the people who run film festivals are about their work. They are so passionate. There will be knockdown, drag out fights around programming, juries, like the whole nine yards because people get so excited about the work and want to go to bat for it. Yeah, me. Me, Lenita, and Jennifer talked for three hours. Like, it was a hard process. Ben, let's go down to you. You told me an interesting story about uh, how when y'all first started getting into film festivals that you might have made a couple of uh, choices that weren't really in your favor. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, we just didn't know what they were. I didn't understand what they could do for us, anything like that. Uh, we started out by just kind of like, I'm from North Carolina, my creative partners were from Georgia and Louisiana. We knew how to be creative and like do super low budget stuff, but we didn't know where that would go or how it would go. So the first thing that we did um, that was like kind of more of that professional level, uh, we just put online on like a Wednesday night. We had like 10 friends over and uh -huh. saw that with them. We were like, okay, great. Now we have like Vimeo and we'll put it up there and we'll see what happens. Um, and we, what we did know and what really pushed us forward at that point was we, we knew we had to be our own advocates. Right, right. So we did a really good job of getting the word out with the press, with blogs, with all of these people making it really easy for them to just take our words and post it as theirs. So we did get like half a million views in a couple of days. What? Uh, That's a lot. It was, yeah, especially wow. like for Vimeo wasn't like this bigger platform or anything uh -huh. like that. Uh, but they were really supportive, and so they started sending the film out to a few festivals. And that's Interesting. Like, we played at um, Edinburgh, and like, mm -hmm. none of us win because who knows what that is. Uh, <laughs> and it ended up being like almost a, exactly a year to the day where it played at South by Southwest and won Best Animation there, and nobody was there. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew what. Nobody on your team was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just didn't have an understanding of like what what did you do because we were so far outside of the idea of an industry mm -hmm. that we had a community of filmmakers and as long as like we got their approval and like yeah. we grew up with people like the Daniels and it was like right. Well, they gave it like they shouted us out. Uh huh. Like, they made cool music videos and so that was like our level of success of what we were trying to achieve is just to impress the people around us in our peer group, right. not realizing that there was this like bigger thing that like maybe eventually we could get paid on this nothing. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but at least like, it, was, it was very much like going out and trying to find the audience was yeah. the thing that helped us get there, uh -huh. but we had no idea where we got right. when we got those opportunities. Right. 
You know, it's really interesting that you say that because I had some filmmakers this in this past January who were in Sundance and with uh, a short documentary. They were one of six short documentaries, and they kept lamenting. We aren't getting in, we didn't get into Can. we didn't get into Telluride, we didn't get into, like it was a whole list of like all the things they didn't get into. But they were getting into smaller festivals. And bit by bit, they were going to those festivals and at each one, they were learning something that they needed to know. And so then, they were at Doc Leipzig in Germany and that's where they really started to figure out like how to be business people. And they're a team too, right? It's another team. So it's not just one filmmaker going by themselves. And we're pretty sure they got scouted out of Doc Leipzig for Sundance. And by the time they hit Sundance, they were ready to rock and roll. They had it all down, they had a plan, they had their press kit, they had contacts with everyone, they had a goal. They had it all, but if they had started at Sundance, they would have not. They wouldn't have known what they didn't know. So I think that it's really important to like embrace smaller festivals, go and learn and grow along the way. Um, can we talk about networking? Uh, because we all know that networking. Everyone's like, you have to expand your network. But how many people in this room are terrified of networking? of walking into a party not knowing anyone. Okay, hardly anyone raised their hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alex isn't scared of networking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also scared of dinner. Oh, that's mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> scared of, that's the Venn diagram. Okay, great. Um, can we talk about your tips for walking into a space where you know no one? and how you navigate it, and how you how, how do you go to a festival to network? What do you do? Anyone want to start? Um, I, I guess back in 2016, when I was on the circuit with that, the feature Driftwood, um, I was going to a lot of festivals. My, uh, my partner on that film couldn't make it to a bunch of festivals, so I was just going solo. And I, don't, I gave myself this, like, I had no backup, I had no fallback, no safety net. I said, I'm going by myself, I'm either gonna be miserable or I have to force myself to go up to people. So I went to every single event and just would go up to someone and go, hey, what film did you make? What did you do? And nearly everybody is very receptive. If you're at a film festival, you wanna talk about your work, hopefully. Um, and no one was a dick about that. Uh, and you just have to train yourself to be forward and be genuinely interested, which I hope you are if you're at a film festival. Any filmmaker should want to talk about their work and to show that interest. You will make very quickly know if you vibe with the person and if you don't, that's totally fine. No one is bad in that situation. Uh, but you go up to enough people, you start seeing who you get along with, you have a similar interest, and then you go out to lunch and start hanging out because they're probably there by themselves or with one other person and have no friends. Uh, so, and also I would say go to a fest if, uh, as early as you can too, because a lot of people are going there with knowing no one else and you start, little clicks form and that's natural, but uh, just throw yourself in the deep end and I've never had a bad experience doing that. I've never gone to a fest solo and then gone away w with nothing. Um, so you kind of have to force yourself into that situation. Even if you're very uncomfortable, it's going to be, there's growing pains, it sucks, I understand, but you will get over it and you'll learn that everyone else is probably just as nervous as you are. Um, and then, you know, you'll break through that very quickly and you'll have a great time. And I went to festivals back in the day that were actually outright scams when I started. I didn't know any better, but even some of those, I met one filmmaker 13 years ago. There's one guy who I'm still very good friends with and we would just laugh like, wasn't that festival of garbage? But we, we got along and it was totally worth it. And I'm so glad I went to this Borderlands Camp <laughs> Festival. Um, and that's happened a, a couple times when I started out and I, I, they're still close friends. And you never know who you will meet where and who you will bump into at a party, who you will just sit at a table to have lunch with at, in a setup just like this at the Lux, um, and who will become a future collaborator that you might work with for the rest of your life. So it's really about being as open as you can. 
I'll, I'll follow. <clears throat> no, I won't. Okay. Um, I'll follow that. Um, as somebody, I, I've met quite a few here. As, as you might know, I am an extrovert, and I still get nervous coming in to people, you know, and that I don't know. But I totally agree with that. Come in early because a lot of these people won't have their friend group yet, and you can create, you know, a friend group around you. And uh, a lot of times, you'll be doing the festival circuit with the same group of people. Um, I started. Uh, the year I also did a short, that was a little passion project of mine, that I was also out by myself with um, a, a lot of these like smaller regional kind of festivals and I have kind of hopped from each one with the same group of people and then we're the people that can be like, we all know each other, but come over here you guys, you know, like, and you can kind of create a community around you. Um, and I also will say, back in like 2016, I went to my first, uh, like festival in LA with a collaborator of mine. Met a couple of people there that, I don't know, two years ago helped produce a film for them. Hadn't, like we kept in touch, but hadn't done anything with them. And then all of a sudden was, you know, helping produce their feature. And then re-collaborated with that same 2016 collaborator um, on a thing in December of this past year. So yeah, you just don't know. It's a timetable of like infinity. It may not happen right away, but if people, you know, feel you and they understand who you are, they'll continue to contact you. Like you will find your community and um, yeah, and just talk to people until your voice goes. It's great. That's what you should do. That's evidence right there. Ben, Caitlin, you want to add? Um. I think just to follow up on that, like, one of the really important things to me is people often think about networking in terms of who you can get to and networking up, um, but I feel like what I've learned over the last decade and what has like, changed my life from film festivals has been networking across and really finding who are your peers and creating an incredibly supportive peer group because you can't trust anybody up there. They're not there for you. They're not there to make your life better. But if you change like the actual filmmaking scene, it was not as like supportive. It was not as developmental or any of that when we came in a decade ago. But if like trying to find these ways where you can really bridge across and be open notebook and be very generous with each other about the contacts that you do have, about the resources that you do have, and trying to create from nothing that sense of abundance with each other. I think that's so much more important than getting a business card from somebody who did this, that, or the other thing. Because the likelihood of them who are there, and they're always being pegged for this thing. Right, you're asking for this one thing rather than finding a real relationship in five, six, seven years later, you find that way where you do intersect and you can collaborate and you can support each other. I would add, yes, let's give that round of applause. Then I would add to that that the people who are closer to where you are in your career or the ones that are like one or two steps ahead of where you are, are they have the information you really need, right? Like if you go to a film festival and you get to meet Steven Spielberg, then he's got a certain type of knowledge and you're making indie films for a hundred dollars on iPhone. Like that that type of knowledge doesn't really match and it's near peer mentorship and yeah. like creating a sense of responsibility in that world as well. Like, it, the second you get a step ahead, you send that ladder back down because otherwise there's just no way for people to find out what the best practices are, who to watch out for, all of these things. Nobody's out there giving you that information. You have to create a trusted network. Trusted network, yeah. Yes, um, I just want to piggyback on that because uh, I think that's something I really believe in and advocate for in the scene with Ben or Ethan Shingle. It's like, um, just because you succeed and somebody else doesn't, or they succeed and you don't, it, there's enough success for everybody. Um, it's the indie space, and so if we create together and we help that next person, like we all succeed because that person will remember that you helped them and you hopefully will do the same thing. And um, man, yeah, the, I, I just 
feel like anybody that's out here, just do your best to, even if it's a PA that's interning or whatever, mentor them, take them under your wing. I've done that for so many people that uh, it's really helped and they've gone on and said like, oh man, I was on this horrible set like right after yours and it was terrible and I was berated every day and I, I just kept thinking I can't wait to work with Tina again. And I think that managing angle is the same way, like that's part of the reason I kept working with them because it, it's, you know, you find a community that actually cares about how you feel on set and won't treat you like that and you will do everything to get back to them. And they will come back and they will work with you, even if it's indie, no budget kind of things. They would turn down a probably bigger job because they won't be treated as such. So just take people under your wing and really help them. And like, everybody's got to start somewhere. We're all learning. You're never going to be the one that knows everything. So just accept that and please help other people. That's lovely. I think relating to that, um, I had my first, I see there's some students here. I had my first film in a festival when I was 17. And I was scared that nobody wanted to talk to me because I was a student and that um, I just didn't know anything. And so, um, but I, what I realized is that like all these filmmakers are so willing to share their knowledge with you that you shouldn't be afraid to like go and talk to them. And you can be like, oh, I had a movie in the festival. Like, uh, and a lot of time they'll go see, like they'll go see it and like watch it for you because they like to support students and they want to help you get better and grow. And I think it's scared of like it's scary at first because it's like these people are so much cooler than me. They have a movie in here and and I'm just a little student. I don't know what I'm doing. But like they they care and they want to help you. So I think it's cool to like uh, just put yourself forward and talk to them. I think that's such a valuable piece of information because a lot of filmmakers that I work with want to be seen as professionals and I'm like take advantage of that produced at New York Film Academy because the fact is that festivals often have segment sections uh, fee, fee reductions based on your student status and the quality of the film is up there, not in whether or not you describe yourself as a student or not. It is on, there is proof. Proof is right up there. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. I have two, two thoughts, because I ask this question about networking all the time. Um, one of my filmmakers once said, Cricket, I always go for the food or the beverage line and start talking to whoever is around me. <laughs> I do that. Um, and the other thing that I think is great, especially for short filmmakers, is that if you're in a program, do the research on who else is in the program with you and start contacting them before you get there because you know Instagram and all the things that are available to us. Or look at the program guide and see who's making films that you're really interested in. and. That way, when you arrive at the opening night party, and I do this often, I'm on a mission. I'm like, I want to find that person, and I will walk around and ask people, where's that person? Does anyone know this person? Until I actually find them, and I meet so many people on that path. Um, so here's my next question. How do we keep in touch these days, y'all? It used to be business cards, and now it's just like, and I have some, I'll give them to you. <laughs> I have a bunch. Uh, but how do we keep in touch? It, how do we keep in touch professionally? And how do we keep in touch? Is it Instagram? Is it LinkedIn? Is it a combo? What happens if Instagram does something awful and disappears? Somebody help me figure this out because I don't. I, I think we need to keep in touch and follow up. But what's the best way? Oh, uh, I, I guess when I started on going to film festivals, it was just Facebook Messenger became. It was business cards and Facebook Messenger. Uh, at this point, I guess we're going to be working with evil companies no matter what, as long as they're there. We're going to keep transferring to a new evil company that our friends are all on. Uh, but using social media has been incredible. I hate social media except for keeping in touch with my friends, mostly filmmaker friends, because we don't even use business cards half the time now. It's it's Instagram. Alex, you are so entertaining on social media, though. You should all follow him. Of, Very entertaining. A lot of uh, naked fetish wrestling on my feet. <laughs> everything you want more. Or you know you want it. Uh, but over the years, anytime I meet a filmmaker, if I had their contact, either just text them or social media is easy because you see someone posting, I'm in this film festival, it's a great reason to just be nice, congratulate, but also you can ask them how the festival was, which is an honest question, but also if you didn't know that person that well, ask them how it went and they will talk to you and you will start having a conversation. Uh, it's, it's really about being genuinely interested. Don't be cynical about it, ask people and mean it. 
and they people respond to that, and I've, I've done that for as long as I can remember because I want you gain information about maybe your film could play there, or you'll just learn something about the person, and that's interesting because people can be wonderful um, and be to stay in contact. I guess that sounds easy, but I, I know friends who just can't do it on social media or what have you. I understand it, but I've always tried to message and ask for advice from when you see anyone is somewhere. It's the, we're all showing the, the false best version of ourselves on social media very often, but there is a truth in there, and there is something you can learn about the person, and someone is putting something online consciously, so they want it to be responded to. Um, I, it's just like any networking, any genuine conversation with people. It just happens to be on apps that are ruining the world. Um, but yeah, so find out who's on Instagram, use that. If they're still using Facebook, I don't know, use the messenger, but realize all your info is being stolen. I guess it's Instagram too. Um, we're, we're all on there, whatever. We gotta do it. It sucks. Um, but yeah, just be interested, be genuine, and ask questions. And I guess that even comes down to when you're at the festival. Dude, right. the magic words are, can I sit here? And then ask questions. It sounds easy, but it's not, and it's nerve-wracking, I get it. But um, yeah, keep, keep that conversation flowing. And even if you meet someone for a second, have a quick conversation, try to get like a number or something, number of social media, and then ask, talk to them more after the fact. Be like, hey, I, it was great meeting you, whatever. Watch their film after the fact, too, if you have access to it. Especially what's great about Tallgrass, they have the online portal, so that's why everyone has to watch Crush the Wrestler if you haven't seen it, <laughs> it's on the portal. But yeah, watch the film, comment about it. Everyone wants to talk about their film and hear what you thought about it, so that's a good conversation starter. And you break the ice and then you become collaborators for life, maybe, who knows. Nice. Anybody else want to talk about how to keep in touch? I, I feel very strongly about taking it <laughs> offline as well, um, putting these opportunities back into the real world. So Agreed. If, so if you're local, yeah. stay in contact, have a monthly meetup. We have like a producer's like therapy group, basically, oh, where they like, go out <laughs> to drinks every once in a while and just like, the, the handful of people who are doing what you're doing, the way that you're doing it, being in person with them, sharing in community, creating those opportunities, being the person who invites people. Um, and the other side of that is they make sure you're here next year, right? Keep creating work so that you always are in the conversation, that especially, like it can be one thing for directors where it's maybe one or two or three projects you can launch a career, but for, uh, for DPs, for producers, it takes years and years and years of being at the same place. And so it's like, we have a, we have a philosophy that we try and encourage each other with is like no alumni badges. Like go and get that badge every year because you got it again make something new constantly so that you're continuing to push the conversation forward, continuing to meet new people, and then continuing to take those new relationships into your future by creating little events, little hangouts, little things like that. It doesn't have to be fancy, but being the one who invites people is going to be a big step forward with that. Ben, I think that, that uh, sense of community helps us deal with what we sustain in terms of rejection or uh, impediments to production or you know anything that, that is going to be tough. I think that's, that's very important. What did you want to add, Tina? Um, I, I'm like, I'm fine, totally fine. Um, I, uh, to kind of piggyback on that, it's just like meeting people as your actual human self, not like, hey, I'm a filmmaker, what do you do? Can you help me? I can help you, kind of a thing. Um, like, make a friend, like, actually know that person, know more about them than their film at a film festival, um, because that's, I'm, as you can see, a coffee addict, and so that's always my thing. It's like, God, I really love talking to you, like, let's go grab coffee, and then we just gossip and hang out, and now we're besties, and that's how I also do in on Instagram and stuff. But yeah, it's just meeting people as people instead of filmmakers. I know we're all filmmakers, but like we're also human beings, so they have other things. Maybe you both like the same thing, and yeah, coffee per se. Um, and you can go do that. And so yeah, I think that's 
that's my best advice for keeping hanging with people. Nice. Um, I just wanted to promote the, if you're from Wichita, the Tallgrass Film Alliance is a thing that happens every Tuesday, um, uh, the first Tuesday of every month. Is that right, Tyler? Third Tuesday? Third Thursday? Third. Thursday, third. <laughs> Melanie? <laughs> it happens on Tuesday. It's, uh, check it out on Facebook, though, if you're from Wichita, it's the Tallgrass Film Alliance, the third. Okay. Um, uh, and, and it's a great way, I'm sure lots of cities have them, it's just a great way to like meet people and like if you're a DP but you don't have anybody uh, to like work with on their film, like there's lots of directors that go there and actors and it's also just a great way to uh, learn from like the local filmmakers. So I think like just meeting in person is, is really great. Community. Nice. Um, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about how many uh, short filmmakers want to transition to making feature films and some tips around that. And I'm going to start out and then throw this open. Actually, I'm going to throw it to Ben because he does something really interesting. Uh, all of you do something interesting. Uh, but many years ago, I was on a panel at the Austin Film Festival, and y'all may know that it's also a big screenwriting conference. and. Every, and it was all about low budget indie filmmaking. And every single person on the, on the panel was talking about how to get a shot for cheap or a location for cheap. They were very, very production oriented. And I was like, screenwriter here, it starts in the screenplay. Like, you don't want to, as a low budget indie filmmaker, you do not want to say you need an explosion and you need like all this stuff to go down. You don't want to write that into your script. You want to start out with like an, a concept that is going to be low budget from the jump. You don't want to have to be making sacrifices for your story or your film, uh, the, the solid nature of your film because your story was higher budget to begin with. And so my rules of thumb around that are few locations, few characters, no special effects, no cuts, no period pieces, and I'm sure people can add to that, no children, no dogs. <laughs> what else? Yes, please, let's do this. Uh, in the case of a uh, feature film I've mentioned a few times, Driftwood from 2016. We, we also went no dialogue as well. <laughs> I, I like expensive. Uh, but but it, it plays into exactly what you said. We, My friend and I had been making short narratives for a couple of years, and we had it like our thesis films from college. We had this deal of whoever finishes their feature screenplay first, the other will just help them however we can. We stuck to that deal. My friend came up with this feature script. And he was thinking just like you said, which was what can we, what can I do with what money we have? And the money we had was eight thousand um, dollars. So we said, okay, one location, three characters. In this case, the we had no dialogue, which wasn't really budgetary based. It's just like this would be interesting, wouldn't it? I guess we can do it. Not thinking how crazy that is, and uh, we just said, screw it, let's go. And again. Going back to what I was talking about with the short doc that led to a series and then a feature, we just made the film we wanted to make and we would have wanted to see at a festival that had if we stumbled into a theater for what money we had and never thinking this is going to play here and which I mean now we have goals where we hope it's something in place more, but we just had none of that. It's just let's make it for us, let's see what happens. And we used the resources we had, which was the money in our wallet and us as crew members, literally two of us, and then we had a brilliant idea of let's bring on a third crew member for a feature film on set. Uh, that was very good. So it was a three-person crew <laughs> and three actors, and you know we just said how can we make this enjoyable as well? One location. We all lived in the location together. We get up in our pajamas, making breakfast, and literally just sometimes putting on jeans, sometimes just staying in pajamas, and just started production. <laughs> um, but it was an amazing experience, but we actively always knew, we, what can we do for this budget that is feasible? And then, you know, we made a film that ended up being fairly successful, which is shocking to us still. Um, but it was purely based on what can we do that makes sense and not overshoot and do like big action scenes or whatnot. So, uh, yeah, we planned for what we had very specifically. 
Yeah, and, and so how do you turn that question inside out, right? How do you not say what can't we do, but how do you make real lists of what, what you do have, what you have access to, what your resources are, how can you make this as ambitious as possible? Because the audience is gonna feel it if the entire time you're saying no to yourself as a creative. Uh, so figuring out what those resources are that you do have, how to write towards them, and how do you put yourself in a position where your film is fulfilling to every audience member because that's that's really like that's who your biggest collaborator is, right? If your film works, the people who spend the most hours on it are the audience by hundreds and hundreds of times of what every crew member puts in together, it's gonna to be the audience that puts more hours into it than anyone. So how do you use the things that you have? Locations aren't that expensive. I mean, like, we, we did a film, Beast Beast, we had probably 28 locations in it. Our entire locations budget was like $200, right? It was just one dance studio that we couldn't get for free because we were shooting in Georgia, in the director's hometown, we were able to do all of that and stuff. And that's what you had, that you were you were in a place that was really going to be, that you could say yes to, and yeah. they could give you locations for free. Yeah, and that fucks your time budget, which is just as important on these small films as your uh, actual budget. So thinking logically of like, how do you want to spend time on the film, to make this, again, as ambitious as possible, are you showing off the actors in the right way, all of these things, but really not trying to uh, compete with like the studio system and the way they make movies, but finding a way to make something that pushes your story as far as possible in a way that can be as satisfying as possible to the audience within whatever resources you can identify. Great, great. Um, Caitlin. What, ha, what, do you, what can you tell us about your experience as a judge watching features this year? What did you see that was working, for example, uh, in terms of story or cinematography or anything that you thought was a, a great move? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I judged like the, the female uh, film category as well as like the documentary narrative one. And um, uh, it was interesting to watch them because like I do want to make features eventually so watching these features was like oh it's cool the way that um, well one of them's playing tonight that was in the category three birthdays and that one was really interesting because it's set in the 70s and I don't know if the filmmakers here but I, I really enjoyed it it was so cool because it's a uh, um, they it looked like they rented like uh, like a 70s house and it was kept between that and a school and it's like just using your resources I don't know it um, I don't know if I have a whole lot of insight on just judging them. I just thought it was cool to watch. But I think that you you bringing up the fact that it was in the 70s and it has sort of limited like locations, right? So if you're going to do a low budget film and you know that your story needs something that you really need to spend your money on, then you can actually like plan that effectively as opposed to like you know, if you're having to go between the 70s and the 30s and present day, that's not going to be as effective, for example. Uh, Tina, you want to add anything? Um, yes. <laughs> she has so much to add, she has to think about it's really it. really just that I could talk for hours. Um, <laughs> and I do. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'd like to give the advice of like, um, you know, Save your million idea, million dollar idea for later, and make your low budget idea look like a million dollars. Um, and kind of in that same vein of like, yeah, use what you have, and it may be 28 locations, but it's locations that you have access to. Um, have a party scene, but maybe shoot it in the hallway, and only see you know a few people come through with cups and use sound design instead of having a thousand teen actions over at your parents' house. They probably won't appreciate it. Um, you know, things like this, like just using what you have to your advantage to up the production, but, or, you know, value, thank you. Jesus, oh guys, uh, your production value, but without spending all the money, um, cause you should see it on the screen, but there are ways around, there's always ways around it. Uh, and I think that's what low budget indie filmmaking is about, is thinking outside that box and you get stuck in this like 
we, we don't have it, how do we make it happen? And all of your collaborators, and be open to the collaborators telling you, like your production designer's gonna tell you what's gonna work and what's not, and you're gonna, you're gonna work it out. Or if a shot you know, down the hall is different than what you wanted, then your DP will help you figure out how to do it. Um, so yeah, just do your best to do it in your amount, like right for your budget maybe, but yeah, up the value in every other way that you can. Great. Um, I'm going to open up for questions in just a minute, but first I would, would like to ask Ben to tell us about his uh, short film to feature program. Yeah, I'll keep that short so we can get into questions, but what we do, it's like a week-long program. We get, say, 600, 750 submissions, depending on the year, from all around the world. And then we take those, find the 10 films that like really speak to each other. One of the ways we like to select is making sure that every film does something better than every other filmmaker. So it's a very natural way for them to get along and for them to encourage each other. Because for us, it should be like at least half of what they're getting out of it is this opportunity to become their own like generation. So what how do you build that cohort in a way that can really speak to each other? And then what we do is um, like a bunch of tents in a backyard in Malibu. We sit, we workshop everybody's film. What are the steps identifying those for each person of how do you remove the hurdles to get you to the, the next place in development or in filming? And then we bring a lot of like first and second time directors to come in and give their stories really um, like no cameras, no anything, because this is going to be um, completely honest and it can be all of the numbers come out, all of the names come out, all of these things. Like you have to create rooms where people can tell the truth about the dark parts of this. And so that's one of the things that we want to do. And we give them mentors and all of that and as much support as we can after, but creating a space where people can really tell the truth to each other and look out for each other in that way. And where can our uh, attendees today find out more about the program? Uh, shortfeature.com or uh, we're on Film for You as well. We uh, just sh shut submissions for this year, but if you come up to me, I can get you a waiver code. Uh, yeah, it will be happening for the fifth time in December. Two of my filmmakers who had very successful festival runs were in the program, I think, a year ago, two years ago, and loved it. Savannah and Taylor and yeah, yeah. Abraham. Yeah, they were both this year. It was this year, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty impressive. And also camping in Malibu, hello, gorgeous. <laughs> All right, we have a first contestant for a question. <laughs> What part of North Carolina are you from, and what do you submit to this program? Uh, right by the farmer's market in Raleigh. Uh, lived in Durham for years as well. Um, yeah, mom taught at state. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, what we take, it, it's just really about this short film. Um, I think you can submit like a director's statement, but don't worry about it, we're never gonna read it. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it, it's really like, you can tell so much about like, what we're looking for is, it's really about craft and how you're thinking about the audience and how you're communicating your story. So we're just looking for like the, the um, not the most perfect, but the most interesting creatives. Yeah. Oh, and what kind of camping is it? Camping or blending? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it gets better year by year. Like, you know, when you don't have to it's buy tense. all the tents and, uh, and the sleeping bags, now we have the foam mattresses and, oh, and all of that. So it is not camping. It's not camping. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> we've got good catering and all of that. But yeah, and lots of rose. Lots of rose. Awesome. Okay, Tyler. Um, question for. Guys, sort of kind of short feature work. Um, do you guys have any thoughts or opinions on uh, what you can do uh, depending on the objective of your short, whether it's just made to make it and then the idea is to use it as a resume piece versus you're making a short film as a concept piece to turn it into a feature? Is there any difference in the approach 
depending on the objective for your short that makes it more successful or less successful? Okay, I'm gonna uh, repeat the question, I hope. Uh, <laughs> if, when you're making a short film, is there a difference in the approach and whether you want to make it as a sort of individual unit a uh, piece as a resume, piece as a calling card versus a proof of concept film that, a proof of concept for a feature film. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the biggest difference is if you're making a proof of concept for a feature that you want to make, you're probably making a much worse short. Uh, Agreed. That's one of the biggest issues of like the most boring stuff, the stuff that just like dries you out. <laughs> when you're watching all of it, um, because they're not making the thing itself. Uh, it's not. It's not an excuse. They care about your audience. Um, if you're showing them something, if you're demanding their eyes, it has to be this thing that they're watching. If you want to do that other thing, keep it private. Just show it to investors. Uh, but make sure that you're delivering the short, and then you worry about the feature later. All you need is the same kind of tone so that somebody knows how to read your feature script. It doesn't have to be the full story. I have seen many people try this proof of concept when they already have a, a feature, and I'm gonna make up a statistic. 99.99% .99 of the time it fails. Um, I've just seen it many times, and I've seen it in screenplay form, and I've seen it in completed film form where I watch the film and I, when I watch my filmmakers' films, I always, I never read the log line, I don't read anything. I just wanna to go to the experience pure. And many times I can spot a proof of concept within about three minutes. And, I, and it's very painful for filmmakers to hear that their short film doesn't hold up as a short film. And Nowadays, we have, there are a couple of festivals, very young festivals, that are uh, working with proofs of concept. But I honestly think most film festivals, real, they're in the business of programming great short films. They're in the business of discovering short filmmakers. And, and, and I think also from a business point of view, if, if you're going out to the world with a proof of concept that doesn't hold up, and that's the first piece that you're taking out to the world, and it doesn't work as its own piece, it is not proof that you can direct a feature. It's the exact opposite. Because the, the leap from directing a short to a feature is huge. I have never done it. I am a screenwriter and a novelist, but I have been a witness to that journey many times. So I'm, I'm always quite hesitant about even saying the words proof of concept. <laughs> Me too. Washington. Oh, oh my gosh. What? All right, reunion at the bar. We'll go get some cheer wine. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you um, created an EPK when you did your video release um, and how many views you got based off of, you said that you, your, when you re did your outreach, you made it where they didn't have to you know, you gave them what to say. So can you talk a little bit about what you created in your outreach to the bloggers and press? Uh, EPK would be way overestimating <laughs> it. it. It's basically yeah. like creating a couple of like really good form emails, keeping it about three paragraphs, and being able to um, identify um, all of these different places that like don't just go after film coverage, right? Figure out who your audience is, they just served by your film, and go after those places that don't have short films for them, right? That's so much more of what becomes successful is when you can get to these bigger outlets that never cover short films because they belong to what you're talking about. We had one short film called Parent Teacher where it's like, it's a one shot, it's a 17 and a half minute rant, basically about this like parent-teacher conference gone wrong in the state of American education system and how it's our parents that are failing so many of our students. 
wasn't real popular. Uh, <laughs> uh, the film coverage, all of that, it didn't get into the festivals that a lot of our films do. But what we did is when we were launching the film, we talked to uh, boardteachers.com, but it had four million Facebook followers. We launched it with them. We got a quarter million views in a day and a half from that, but we also put together two like 25 second gifts of it, of like, hey, here's like, one really funny joke with one really important moment and statement in it, and we put those out with them as well, and those got three, four million views in a day, two days, uh, because we gave something that was for them and about them, and we talk about uh, that film is a language, and we don't fucking mean it. We mean that for us, and we take that, and we say, this is our way of communicating, but if a film's successful, it belongs to the audience, and you give them a way to communicate. I think it's very helpful to create a press kit and put it in your uh, film freeway account. Uh, you never know how it will get used. Judges often use it to make decisions uh, around awards. And also we've had uh, filmmakers get full, full articles in newspapers based on the FAQ that a filmmaker created. So I think that it's always a good idea to create a press kit. Um, oh my goodness, Milan has a question. It's two parter. What's the what's the best length for a short? Uh, and second, I get a call a, a call pretty often. Like, how do I sell? How does how do I sell my short? And I usually tell them you have the wrong number, and I hang up. <laughs> <laughs> so those, those are my two questions. Okay. How, what is the right length for a short, and how do you sell a short? How do you get it, sell it into distribution? Okay, team, go. As to how to sell the short, uh, make a short documentary on a fetish wrestler with a very popular <laughs> website and a huge fan base, and then eventually sell it directly to his fan base, which is our goal. Um, I, I do have a personal philosophy about shorts and length, and it's not correct, but this is just what I've gone by over the years, and I've done screening for a few festivals, and this is very generalized, but what I've noticed is that narrative shorts usually seem to be best, um, like around, you get 12 minutes is key, 15 is the max, and then it better be really fucking good if it's beyond that. And docs, for whatever reason, I feel like there's an added few minutes to that, or like you want to maybe go for 15, up to 18, and then it better be really good if it's beyond that. Now that's just maybe a personal preference. It just seems like they work better like that, but another example is a friend of mine sent me a narrative short he made, uh, and it was at 25 minutes when he sent it, and he had sliced it down to 22, and it was like riveting and incredible, and the style was wild, and it's so him, and I loved it. I was like, you're breaking all my rules, and it's great. So there's no nothing concrete, but I, tend to adhere to that. And for, so I, when I made Crush the Wrestler, I had a goal of like, I think this story can max out at 18 and I should not go beyond that. And then I willed it, willed it, was laser focused, got it to 14 minutes. So that was in my head just because I feel that's the, that tends to work best. Maybe not factually correct, but personally correct. I think it's about pacing, as you said. And I, I think that if you've got a film that's 25 minutes long and there are twists and plot twists and turns and all this sort of stuff and you're riveted from beginning to end, that's great. If you've got a film that is 25 minutes long and needs to be 17, it's very painful. I had a filmmaker recently who cut six minutes out of a short she had already spent thousands of dollars submitting to festivals. Um, the, uh, the 40 minute shorts just don't get programmed. <laughs> Even if a well. festival sells very, very them, rare. it's yeah. so hard very for them. Very rare. They, it better hard. be a masterpiece, usually. Or it's just, it is hard because what do you put with a 40 minute short? It's, it's not an easy thing to park. So if your goal is to be seen at a festival, if you're making half hour to 40 minute shorts, it's very, very difficult to be programmed. Even if it is really good, actually. Some, I was talking to someone today that I, I, when I was starting out, I used to get really mad when I would hear uh, oh, we just couldn't find a place for this film at the festival. I'm like, I have bullshit. If they like it, they could get it in. And then as I started screening and understanding programming more, it's like, oh, that is, it is true at times. Sometimes a film can be great and it just 
doesn't make sense for a variety of reasons that are completely beyond your control and not necessarily indicative of quality. So that happens, but you know, don't make a 40 minute short. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously for programming it and all, it's like that 10 to 12 minutes is like a nice sweet spot. Um, if you can get under that, you'll have an even better probably chance of getting programmed. Um, but pacing is definitely it, and it's something that when I am, you know, producing shorts and stuff, usually have this conversation in the script writing, like making sure the script's ready to go. Uh, but come in as late as possible, leave as early as possible. Like a good LA party, you know. Um, <laughs> that, that's always kind of the goal, um, just get, get in late. As, like, you don't need a lot. Sometimes people write a lot of stuff that happens before the action actually starts, and then we end up chopping it anyway once we're in the edit. So if you don't waste the time to film that, you have more time to actually, you know, have a couple extra setups, and you might get better stuff. So yeah, that's my biggest thing when I'm talking about how are we gonna get this to feel really tight, like just a really tight short, because that's what you want. You don't want your audience to have a moment to be bored when you're actually watching it. Make sure if it's tension, the tension's going. You don't have it like drop. And if it's comedy, like don't let it lay too long. Um, and yeah, just yeah, tight under ten minutes, maybe. Okay, good. Does anyone have anything to say about short film distribution? Yeah, I can handle that quick. Um, the most important thing is going to be having your film on a place where they can follow you and get you can get back to them. Have an email capture. Have all of that stuff. It doesn't matter if you get fifteen hundred dollars for this thing, because you're not. If you're in shorts to make money, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, make sure that it's as available as possible to be able to find that audience, take that audience from each project to each project, and keep building it that way. And there are ways to make money to keep doing the next thing. Like we, it used to be a lot more popular with like foreign TV channels and all of that, but if you just look up like PDF search engines for short film buyers, there's a lot of email addresses out there and you can just send it out to that. There's also um, a handful of agencies that like, and you're talking about like a couple hundred euros here or there or there, but it also, again, it helps build your path forward. Um, so when your features start coming out in this territory and you've been on all of their televisions for four, five, six shorts already, that's when it starts to matter because you're already coming in as a known quantity. So it can be worth the legwork, but think of it as distribution and don't think about it as trying to make money. How do you get more people to watch your film? Can I just clarify, having it available, I also Yeah, yeah, having it available. And, and if you're trying to do uh, a feature of it, have a Kickstarter uh, WeFunder page for Crowd Equity that launches the day that you launch your short film. It is so much harder to go back and get in touch with your audience than it is to have that thing right there. That's what we did for our film Beast Beast. It won a couple of awards at South by Southwest. We stayed up all night and launched a Kickstarter the next day. And not, it wasn't about that $20,000. It was about making that statement, raising money publicly, that we got the rest of our funding from people who found out about it because we were being loud at the moment where we could be loud. Nice. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yes. Uh, I'm just curious to know if you guys made anything and in the final product you just realize, man, this isn't working and where you decide to do rewrites and reshoots or where you decide that the film is just a lesson learned and it'll be a portfolio piece and move on. Did anyone ever make a film that they realized wasn't working and what did they do? Did they keep moving forward and figure out a way to fix it or did you uh, just leave it up? Leave it be. We made a ton of stuff that didn't work for years. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing to be ashamed of with that. Like sometimes it is worth putting something out still, like, okay, this works enough. Sometimes you just cut it into your reel or like give it out to the actors so they can use it in their reels. But like, there are ways to solve and you can fight for it. And I think having that 
again, those community creators around you that can workshop things. We, we do a lot of rough cut screenings in person, doing two at a time so you get different feedback. So those types of things for trying to get uh, the right answer, but the right answer could be it ends up in your actor's wheels and nowhere else. Yeah. Some things are really bad, and that's okay. You learn a lot from that. I think that is a, it's such a great question because you know, the only way that we learn how to make films is by making films, right? And it just so happens that this medium is so demanding in terms of collaboration and number of people involved and everything that I think we always want a project to be really great for everyone. But sometimes they're just not gonna work. And I think we have to give ourselves the grace and permission to try things out and fail because that really is how you develop and it is true that sometimes there you're just missing a shot friends of mine were nominated for an Academy Award they forgot to get the shot that started the whole thing and they had to go back and reshoot it months later they forgot it was the most important shot and they did it was so important they didn't put it on the shot list and they forgot it um, but you, yeah so sometimes things are salvageable and sometimes you just go, I am learning. I am in a state of learning and I am giving myself permission for that. So, yeah. I want to pop in and say, yeah, I am, that's something that happened early on uh, before I actually moved to LA. And um, I learned the most I think I've ever learned off of a shoot that was just kind of a complete failure. Uh, but we ended up salvaging it by making it into a music video for a local band that the director was friends with. Uh, and so we got to still use it and then slice in some footage of the band and it worked really well. But I learned so much and I never made certain mistakes because of that exact situation. So yes, fail, feel free to fail. Because um, you might have a music video out of it sometime. That's <laughs> awesome. You might have a music video. All right, one last question. And as far as like, um, you're talking about like uh, development labs, producing labs, and ways to use your script, workshops, all that. Just like film festivals, there's like added like, options. You know, so like, how do you guys recommend that you guys use for yourself to see this work like this? You should be like, you should like, be more something like that. Cool. Um, obviously, there's a lot. I feel like a lot of like, how do you vet the labs and the different types of mentorships that are available for writing or directing or producing? Like competitions. The competitions. So like screenwriting competitions? Okay. I have some thoughts on this, but anybody want to? I would say a more general approach is again like asking around, but also like making sure that you're not waiting because you're waiting on an answer. I think that's one of the most important things that like, it is so hard to do this and no rubber stamp from even the biggest place matters. You go back and you look at all of these films that like, a film like Short Term 12, right? It wins Sundance as a short. He goes and he writes the script and it wins the nickel. Right, the biggest screenwriting prize I ever. They can't raise half a million dollars, right? So they take the nickel prize money and they shoot a feature in their apartment that the director and the producer were living in the one bedroom apartment. They do it, gets into Sundance for sixty-five thousand dollars, and they try and raise money for Short Term Twelve again, and they still can't get it as they go around and knock on all these doors. And we've had that experience when we won Sundance with Doug Wood the Short. We then went out, had 70 different meetings. Everybody told us no, we finally launched and did it ourselves. But like, if you keep waiting, like, great, apply, apply, apply. These things can be great. There are ways to build community, they're all of that. But like, you have to make a plan that is not reliant on their yes or no. Let them say yes, let them say no. Keep asking those questions, get their answer. But they can't decide whether or not you make this thing. I think that part of it is, to, you know, you can go on cover flight, you can go on, go on freeway, but to me it's all about who are the people involved, who started this, what is their background. Um, 
do they list their judges? Do they list the, what are their background? I had a filmmaker recently, a screenwriter, who came to me and said, I want to submit to these competitions, but, and look who their, their uh, judges are. And I have no money. That was the first thing. Cricket, I have no money. And I'm like, okay, now how do I advise this person? They want to submit to something, they have no money, they're, they're struggling, it's the pandemic, it's the, I don't know, pandemic strike situation. And I thought about it and I was like, you know, I think you should really dive into who these judges are and what kind of work have they done and would they be interested in your work? And the answer was no. None of these people were interested in what she was doing, and we had that conversation, and that kind of set her on a path of being able to thoughtfully choose where she wanted to submit her work. But at first, when she came to me, it was like, look at how great these people these are, these people are, and they were great. They were, they just were probably not likely. None of them had low budget indie background. They were all development track Hollywood. So I think that's one thing. And I think that some of the screenwriting competitions in particular, look at who their sponsors are, look at who is giving them money, look at what they're promising. Um, they're promising vague stuff. <laughs> Maybe stay away from them, but if they're like, yeah, like, I mean, I can throw a party in 10 minutes out front and but if they're like, we're gonna get you a meeting with this management company, that is more specific because they're saying someone's name. And so I think that the more vague something is, the, the more suspicious I am. Yes? I can speak to that a little bit. I've done the Celebrate Pleasant, I'm on Howard's program in 2019. Um, I would say look, look at the people who go to the program and what they did next. If the program helped their career, if it didn't, it's probably not going to help yours. Mm -hmm. If they helped them, then yeah, they probably submit to it. That's what I look at. Like, what the, the cohort before me, what happened to their Look who else has done the program and what they've done since. That's great advice. Nice. Um, Y'all, I feel like we could continue this conversation for another hour or so. There are a lot of things. Can we have one final quick take from each one of you? I'm going to say mine first, like a quick piece of advice. Um, my quick piece of advice is please keep your credits for your short film short, 30 to 45 seconds. Please keep your trailers for your short film short, 30 to 45 seconds. Thank you. Uh, I'm just kind of repeating what I said near the beginning, but make your short film for you and be honest as you make it and that is your proof of concept of your own talent. Don't make it for anyone else. Nice. Um, I think find people that you work well with and uh, you enjoy working with, so then you at least have a good experience even if it doesn't end up doing anything. But, um, yeah. Um, and remember that we're filmmakers because we love what we do and it should be fun, even if it's hard work. And um, yeah, just respect each other and make films with love. Uh, earn the title filmmaker. Think of it like being a weightlifter. If you would be embarrassed to call yourself a weightlifter with the amount of time that you spend doing it and doing it and doing it, rather than just talking about it. Think about that. Think about how you can get on more sets with more people and just keep getting better at it because that's, that's going to be the thing. It's just repetition, 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 and you're going to get great at it. And don't worry about is this thing successful? It is not its own. It is part of your career, it's part of your path. And you're going to give up at some point if you keep waiting on this laurel or that laurel or that outside recognition. Just keep getting better at it. Can we give everybody a round of applause? Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to, thanks to all of you for being here today and asking your questions and taking in this information. Uh, if you want to keep in touch with me, I have a business card. And if you email me, I'll put you on my mailing list. And I send out cool stuff every once in a while. So come up and I'll give you a card. Yes, old school. Uh, thank you, Tallgrass. Have a great day, everyone.